Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Clackamas County Board of Commissioners issues and updates on March 7, 2023. County Administrator Gary Schmidt, what's up first? Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, first, Commissioner West is out of the office today and will not be present. Your first, uh, your, all these items today are under the Board of County Commissioners. Uh, legislative update staff said there is not one pressing, so I'm taking that off the agenda. The next item is consent agenda requests. We'll start with disaster management, item one. Approval of an amendment adding funding for building damage assessment training to the 2020 Urban Area Security Initiative subrecipient agreement with the City of Portland. The amendment value is $11,000. The agreement value is increased, total agreement value is increased to $290,191. No county general funds are involved. Daniel Nybauer, Disaster Management. Go ahead. Uh, Daniel Nybauer, Interim Director, Disaster Management. The 11,000 will allow us to hold two uh, damage assessment trainings for post-earthquake damage, and that's one of the most requested trainings uh, from internal partners as well as uh, our city and special district partners. Any questions? Uh, Commissioner Shaw? Yes, Daniel. <clears throat> this training is just for the city of Portland and your office, is that right? No, uh, it's for uh, Clackamas County okay. uh, departments as well as okay. cities, special districts in okay, Clackamas good. County. Okay, thank yeah. you. Okay, any other further questions or objections? See none, thank you. Okay. Next, transportation and development. Item one, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with the Oregon Department of Transportation for right-of-way services for the Southeast Johnson Creek Boulevard, 79th place, 82nd Avenue project. Total agreement value is $10,000. Total project value is $2,856,705. Funding is through the Community Road Fund, County Road Fund Development Agency, federal funds, and House Bill 2017. No county general funds are involved. Dan Johnson, Transportation and Development. Go ahead. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Smith, uh, Commissioners. Uh, Clackamas County obtained an All Roads Transportation uh, Safety Grant, ARTS um, is what it's known as. Uh, from the Oregon Department of Transportation to implement safety improvements on Southeast Johnson Creek Boulevard from 79th Place to 82nd Avenue. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is one of our highest ranked safety priority index projects um, within our current system. Um, the safety improvements include adding sidewalks, ADA ramps, a signal at the intersection of Johnson Creek Boulevard and 79th Place, and constructing a raised median curb in the roadway um, for pedestrian safety. Um, essentially, we are here today, oh, pardon me, uh, the Internet Government Agreement, um, because there's federal funding associated with it, the right-of-way has to be certified by ODOT, and so basically we have to pay for their services. Uh, so basically this is an agreement with ODOT um, for right-of-way services to the tune of up to $10,000. Mm. Thank you very much, up to $10,000. Questions or comments, seeing no objections. Item two, approval to apply for a regional travel options grant with Metro for transportation demand management strategy planning. Grant value is $215,000 for three years with a match of $24,607. Funding is through Metro and federal funds with a match funded through the county road fund. No county general funds are involved. Uh, so basically, uh, transportation demand management strategies, TDM. Um, essentially, this is a project um, to basically build efficiencies within the various systems that we have. And so you talk about what those efficiencies might be and what those efficiencies might look like. Essentially, this work is focused around, uh, for example, assisting in marketing of transit options. So for example, Clackamas Connect Shuttle, uh, things of that nature. Uh, improving bus shelters uh, for folks that are using uh, transit. Um, accessing rideshare tools, things of that nature, uh, possibly development of van, po van, uh, van pools for groups traveling to certain areas, and maps and directional assistance. Essentially, it's uh, providing, it's connecting people to other transportation services um, that are above and beyond their current uh, single occupancy vehicle. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item three, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with Clackamas Community College to provide scholarships to student education programs. Value, total value is $70,000 for one year. Funding is through county lottery dollars. No county general funds are involved. February 7th, harken back to that date. Uh, we were in front of this board and the board directed uh, up to $70,000 be directed towards scholarship services with Clackamas Community College in a partnership. Um, as the board knows, uh, between jurisdictions, we need an IGA to exchange dollars. Essentially, this IGA is with Clackamas Community College. 
um, directed to expanding scholarship offerings to add expedited career pathways for two-year programs with a desired outcome of increasing jobs that meet the self-sufficiency standard wage rate. So um, the IGA is here. If you have any, we reviewed this with County Council. It has been reviewed. Um, it is built off other cooperative agreements we've had with Clackamas Community College, but essentially um, um, affirms and um, advances the project and direction the board had requested. Questions or comments? None. <clears throat> Anyone hear that high-pitched noise? Yes. Okay. It's distracting. It's the Courthouse Construction Commissioners. I'm sorry it's going to be for two more years. I thought the beeping was, but that's, that seems a little bit odd. I haven't heard that one before. That's a new noise. Is we'll check on it. Okay. Yeah, it's like a ring. It. Yeah, it's constant. Not everyone can hear it, I'm sure. Done with me? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Any questions or objections to this moving forward? Seeing none, thank you, Dan. Next, Health, Housing, Human Services, item one, approval of an amendment extending the duration and adding language to the scope of, of an intergovernmental agreement with the Oregon Department of Human Services. For the operation of Community Development Disability Services, the amendment value is $293,450. The agreement value is increased to $28,518,535 for two years. Funding is through the federal Medicaid funds and state general funds. No county general funds are involved. Rod Cook, Health, Housing, Human Services. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, this agreement provides the base funding for services to developmentally disabled children and adults in Clackamas County, and it will fund things such as administration, case management, and abuse investigations. This is ARPA funding. It's one-time funding, um, and last year we served about 2,400 clients uh, through this agreement. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections, thank you. Item two, approval of a local subrecipient grant agreement with the Portland Opportunities Industrialization Center for Education and Outreach to African American and Latino, Latina, Latinx communities for the Commercial Tobacco Prevention Community Grant. Grant value is $20,000 for six months. Funding is through the Oregon Health Authority. No county general funds are involved. You remember last week we had about eight of these, and so you'll have about six um, of these today, but this is those $20,000 grants that went for tobacco prevention through uh, came through our, our fiscal agency, but it, it's spread out through multiple nonprofits throughout the county. So, and most of them are culturally, um, they serve culturally diverse uh, populations. Questions or comments on this? Seeing no objections. Item three, approval of a memorandum of understanding with Multnomah County for participation in a CARE Oregon Naloxone, how do you say that? Naloxone. Naloxone, thank you. Distribution project agreement value is $440,000 for 21 months. Funding is through CARE Oregon. No county general funds are involved. Yeah, I think commissioners have spoke to this issue, but uh, data from vital statistics shows 86 confirmed deaths for 2021, the highest our county has ever seen, and an 87% increase from 2019. Uh, one evidence-based strategy being used to address the rising number of fatalities is to increase the availability of naloxone, a medication approved by the FDA to reverse opioid overdose, overdoses, particularly among, among vulnerable populations. Um, in 2021, Clackamas County Public Health uh, Division distributed 6,500 kits countywide. And this would fund more of that. Questions or comments? Commissioner Scholl? Mm -hmm. This is really a tragedy that we have to have this in our county to counter the scourge of drugs that we're experiencing. It's really sad. Uh, this program comes with what kind of training? Um, the training, uh, the training for the the administrators of it. Because or, this is going to come down. Will it come down to our schools? Uh, Fire departments, police officers, okay. all the all the first responders typically will have something with them. You can also give this out to, uh, I'll say, uh, individuals like ourselves who could be trained on, you know, parents or something who think they may run across somebody in their family, somebody on the road. Uh, they can have a kit with them also to be able to administer it on the spot if they saw somebody overdosing. So the training would come that to them that way as well. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item four, approval of a local subrecipient grant agreement with the Portland Open Bible Community Pantry for Education and Outreach to People of Color for the Commercial Tobacco Prevention Community Grant. Grant value is $20,000 for six months. Funding is through the Oregon Health Authority. No county general funds are involved. 
This is another one of the $20,000 tobacco prevention uh, projects in open, Portland Open Bible is one of those community church or community pantries that have agreed to do that education and outreach to, to folks. And who are they educating? Um, it, it would be, uh, well, this is going to focus on people of color, uh, but it's uh, anybody who might be, certain populations are targeted by the tobacco industry. You know. So they come to Clackamas County? There, this this organization will work in Clackamas County and Multnomah County, okay. and so it all depends where wherever they come into their systems. That's that's who they'll. When they come into a system, yes. then they're referred. That's a yes. referral service. Okay. Any other questions or comments? See no objections. Item five: approval of a revenue services agreement with HealthShare of Oregon for reimbursement of community-based public health services to Medicaid members. The agreement value is $664,258 for one year. Funding is through Health Share of Oregon. No county general funds are involved. Uh, yeah, this, this is a revenue source of financial assistance for the following services. Uh, it will fund our Blueprint for Healthy Clackamas program. That's our small grants program. Uh, supplies and technical assistance to community-based organizations that partner with public health divisions that provide harm reduction services to combat viral hepatitis. HIV and other infections, and lastly, uh, increases access to mother and child health services such as home visits, women and infants and children, WIC, the, our WIC program, and children, uh, childhood immunizations. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item six, approval to apply for SNAP training and employment program funding to increase employment services in Clackamas County. Anticipated grant value is $163,000 for one year with a match of $163,000. Funding is through the Oregon Department of Human Services, Metro Supportive Housing Service Funds, and $42,000 in budgeted county general funds. Now, this is a joint effort with the Clackamas County Sheriff's Office uh, to provide employment services to those leaving incarceration. Uh, the program assists recipients in developing skills, finding work that will lead to self-sufficiency through training, support services, and job placement to help them enter and advance to the workforce. Uh, la well, estimated that we would serve uh, is about 120 residents coming out of incarceration on the, with this program. 120 residents a year? Per year, yes. Per year. With this, with this particular grant, yes. Wow, that's pretty cool. Other questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item seven, approval of an amendment adjusting fiscal year 2022 and 2023 funding and updating program language to a revenue intergovernmental agreement with Oregon Health Authority for the financing of public health services. The amendment value is $319,214.48. Total agreement value is increased to $16,405,712.52 for two years, funding is through the Oregon Health Authority. No county general funds are involved. Uh, yes, this agreement funds the Clackamas County Public Health Division HIV Prevention Services, the Tobacco Prevention and Education, and Women, Infants, and Children's with the WIC program, and the school-based health centers. Questions or comments? S seeing no objections. Item eight, approval of Clackamas County facility lease agreement with Genoa Healthcare for rental of clinical space. The agreement value is $8,118.48 for nine months. Funding is through Genoa Healthcare. No county general funds are involved. Yes, uh, Genoa Health uh, LLC previously leased space in the Hilltop Clinic. Due to the courthouse being built on Red Searles campus, the pharmacy must be relocated to the new health center's behavioral health space within DSB. So basically they were with us over there and they're still, they, they moved in with us over at DSB. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. All right, thank you. That is the request for consent agenda. All of these will be on this Thursday's business meeting agenda for your final approval. Next item, paid leave Oregon clarification. Uh, this is a request for you to sign a letter, commissioners. We have Kathleen Rastetter, assistant county counsel, to present. There was also a memo in your packet. Go ahead, please, Kathleen. Good morning, Chair Smith, commissioners. Um, I'm here on behalf of leave administration asking for authority to uh, sign on to a letter by the city of Portland. And this has to do with paid leave Oregon, which as you know, is a brand new leave law in Oregon that starts in September of this year. It's a leave law that intersects with other leave laws like the Family Medical Leave Act and the Oregon Family Medical Leave Act in ways that appear to be contradictory. 
And so the city of Portland had asked the um, Oregon Bureau of Labor and Industries for some clarification, and they gave an oral opinion, but the city would like a written opinion or an administrative rule that essentially explains the conflict and, and what the state's view on that conflict is. The city of Portland also intends to do a, a similar, and I included the draft letter in the packet um, it, with the memo for you to see, but they also intend to do a letter to the federal government asking for a similar clarification on the federal law. Uh, as of today, the city of Portland, Multnomah County, Oak Wa Lodge Water Services are all signing on this letter. Um, the attorney was going to reach out to Washington County and TriMet, but I haven't heard as of today whether they were also going to join this letter. Mm -hmm. So we think it's in the best interest to have these conflicts in the law clarified for, for everyone. Uh, this is a statewide law, paid leave Oregon, and so we're just asking for um, authority to join the city of Portland and Multnomah County and Oak Lodge in signing on to this letter. Okay, we have a letter. It starts on page three, correct? It's single-spaced and fairly long. It is. It's a, it's rather technical. Okay, um, I, and, I, and I read through it. I'm not saying I understand everything on it, but I am more than willing um, to go along with these folks on it. Is there further discussion? Commissioner Scholl? Yes, uh, Kathleen, uh, first could you define what safe leave is? Safe leave is uh, domestic violence victims and their families, and so we do have a law already in existence, but Paid Leave Oregon will sort of broaden that coverage. So Paid Leave Oregon covers family leave, medical leave, and safe leave, and that is uh, usually domestic violence victims. Okay, and by signing off on this letter, is there any expense to the county involved? No, we're just asking for clarification of these laws. Okay, thank you. Any further questions on this? Commissioner Schrader. Yeah, um, I, I read it. My understanding of this is that they're all three different laws that kind of do the same thing, and we just want to know which one we're going to follow. Is that kind yeah, of the it's, gist of it's this? It's more or? complicated than that. Really? These laws uh, intersect and in a way that appears to be contradictory on, on one piece, but the Oregon Family Medical Leave and the Federal Fam Family Medical Leave Act already exist. Oregon then passed Paid Leave Oregon, which covers a few more circumstances and broadens definitions from those other laws. So it's going to be a, a more, a we're going to have to deal with all three laws is basically well, the short answer. One at the state level, so we've mm -hmm. got yes. three governmental jurisdictions. Okay, I get it. Thank you. Further questions or comments? Gary, do we need to entertain a motion? Yes, please. I'll entertain a motion. I move approval of the letter as written. Second. Uh, Commissioner Schrader has moved uh, approval of a letter regarding, what do I want to call this? Family Medical Leave Act. Paid Leave Oregon Clarification, where other counties are signing, or jurisdictions signing on. Commissioner Savas has seconded that motion. Any further comments on this? Seeing none, Tony, please take the poll. Commissioner Scholl. Aye. Commissioner Savas. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye. Motion passes 4-0. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next item, Oregon Department of Transportation Great Streets application. This is also a request for a support letter. There's a memo in your packet. Dan Johnson Transportation and Development will present. Chair Smith, Commissioners, um, before you is a request to submit a letter of support for the o o ODOT Region 1 application for the 2024-2027 Great Streets Grant application. In short, every ODOT region submits projects with a certain intent to tend around safe streets, basically uh, state facilities that act kind of like main streets in certain areas, um, and this is this has no requirement from county staff, no requirement for funding, no requirement for project management. It simply is the fact that we support the advancements of this project in Rotodendron. 
Essentially, we've done a number of studies up there and the necessity for uh, rhododendron and additional pedestrian improvements and safety improvements along um, Highway 26 in that area has been a high priority in a number of plans. So we're here before you today to basically ask your authorization to submit the letter um, proposed. When you talk about state highways acting as main streets through our local communities, of course, rhododendron is very true, but you look at the city of Canby, mm -hmm. Malala, mm -hmm. Estacada, and Sandy, just to name four. Mm -hmm. And all four of those cities are growing hugely. Yep. I'm glad to be able to see this here. I hope we can do similar actions for the other cities. So every region, just um, thank you so much for bringing that up, because every region, region one, there's different regions in NODOT, obviously, as you know. Um, region one is putting forward four projects. I don't have a list of them for me today, but I can find that out for you. And I can also find out when all the projects have been submitted, what those encompass. So. Okay. Um, we have a letter before us, commissioners. I have, I assume we've all read it. Uh, do we all want to sign this? Uh, one commissioner is absent today and not able to sign it, or we can do it on the behalf of. Do you have a preference? Chair, I move we approve the letter and uh, sign it individually. Noting that one commissioner isn't here, or we, I suppose we could wait for tomorrow, Gary, when he returns. What's the deadline, Dan? <laughs> uh, I don't think it's tomorrow. Um, do you have any other topics to discuss? Commissioners, my, my opinion only, if you wish to hear it, is you should save all five signatures for really, really important, yeah. significant letters, and this is not one. Okay, I'll accept a motion to approve this letter um, and just the chair sign it because we have one commissioner absent and it will look odd, I believe, having four commissioners sign it when there are five. That would elected. be just fine. Yep. So moved. Second. Oh, Thank you. Commissioner Show has moved. We uh, approve the letter and sign it. And Commissioner Schrader has second the motion. Any further discussion? I get one question. Yeah, Mark. Dan, did the Hoodland CPO give you input on this? Not on this specific request, okay. but they were, they were involved in the plans that are referenced in the letter. Okay, right. good. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, no further questions. Tony, please take the poll. Commissioner Savas. Aye. Commissioner Schrader? Aye. Commissioner Scholl? Aye. Chair Smith? Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Next, Supportive Housing Services Quarterly Update. Uh, there's a memo in your packet. Rod Cook and Vahid Brown from Health Housing Ser and Human Services will present. Looks like uh, no. Just Vahid by yourself. Yeah, so. Okay. Vahid, go ahead. Fine You've got me. it. Good morning, Chair. Commissioners, I'm Vahid Brown, Deputy Director of Housing and Community Development. Uh, with your uh, update on our quarterly report for quarter two of this fiscal year for the supportive housing services measure. This is informational only. This is not, does not require a vote. Um, this, uh, you know, pursuant to our obligations under the supportive housing services intergovernmental agreement, we quarterly report on our outcomes and expenditures and the, um, in pursuit of our annual work plan goals. And this is just an informational briefing about our quarter two, which concluded in December. Uh, and some of the highlights of, of uh, what we've been up to in, in that quarterly period. Uh, in quarter two of this fiscal year, we saw pretty dramatic expansion of our system across all kind of categories. Um, our, the expenditures of our uh, programs and services being delivered under this measure uh, more than doubled from the previous quarter. So that's in indicative of our, you know, the, the contracts that we've been setting in motion over the last year and a half have been, are now starting to deliver services and incur expenses uh, at, at, at growing and increasing rates. Um, 124 people were placed into permanent supportive housing in the quarter. Um, 80 people were placed in permanent supportive housing in the previous quarter. So again, a significant expansion of the pace at which people are being placed into permanent supportive housing from long-term homelessness. Overall, since the program was launched, 385 people have been placed in permanent supportive housing, which is a huge step forward for Clackamas County, uh, which typically would see a tenth or less of that in a year. Um, we also launched uh, new programs and services in the quarter, uh, uh, um, 
concluding a large procurement that was issued in the previous quarter. So that's uh, contracts were uh, negotiated and executed in the second quarter with a total value of over $8.5 million. It's a, and I've mentioned before, that was the single largest procurement in the history of Clackamas County for, for housing and homeless services. So those contracts are now all executed. And that's why we're, we're beginning to see these, these expenses incurred, because there's not now this this whole network of providers delivering these programs. So we saw um, just a couple of highlights. One of the, the, the big components that we didn't previously have in place is outreach and engagement. So we executed five new contracts in quarter two for outreach for folks to go out in the community, identify people experiencing homelessness in the community, work with them directly, and connect them to, to safety off the streets and to housing. Um, so that's, that's a component of our system that's long uh, lacked investment historically. We have not had the capacity to go out and identify people in the community and work with them where they are. And now we have that outreach program and it's coordinated by a member of my team. Um, but we also grew our safety off the streets programming, two new contracts for shelter with CWS and Northwest Housing Alternatives and uh, new program contracts in the remaining components of our services, navigation, placement, and permanent support of housing. We also launched um, a, a, a new partnership with health centers in health, housing, and human services with two behavioral health case managers for housing assistance. This is a really cool program where folks who are accessing our behavioral health clinics and are, are getting um, treatment and recovery services or mental health services and are experiencing homelessness, we now fund two case managers in the behavioral health clinic who I can identify folks who are accessing our programs and services for behavioral health but are homeless and assist them in obtaining permanent housing while continuing to engage with us on their treatment and behavioral health needs. So that's a, that's a great uh, new step in our coordination with the behavioral health system to, you know, to support the whole needs of the person, including their treatment needs, as we address their homelessness. Um, those are some of the highlights of quarter two. I'll conclude my remarks there and open it for any questions that the commissioners have. Well, this is quite a comprehensive report. I'm sure commissioners want to uh, opine on it. I'm very happy to hear about behavior health case managers, two more. Uh, I'm happy that we have those. And Vahid, you mentioned 385 additional people have been placed in supportive housing. Is that countywide? Um, no, that is actually only within the metro area. That's what I thought. Mm. So whereas all these dollars we're getting are concentrated within the urban growth boundary, what are we doing for the, what resources do we have available for people outside that area? Obviously, they're, they're not as much, um, and there's a huge disparity there as far as dollars is concerned. Um, can you talk about that? Yes, and that is something that the, the Housing and Community Development Division is focusing on and is prioritizing is looking at the, the, the funds that we have available to us and to our system from the state primarily. Uh, that are not restricted to the metro region and um, uh, reducing the contracts that have that money uh, in the metro regions, uh, kind of replacing their state funding with SHS funding so that that state funding can be redirected to the rural parts of the county. Okay. We've already begun that and we just are now moving into um, contract negotiations on three procurements that were actually issued in quarter two and these are mentioned in the quarterly report. We put out three procurements, one for youth homeless services, one for rapid rehousing, and one for uh, supportive housing case management. Um, now, as we're moving into contract negotiations with the awards that were announced from those procurements, we're blending general fund dollars. So the, the several years ago, the board made a $1.2 million commitment for housing and homeless services. That's the Affordable Housing and Services Fund. Housing and Community Development administers that. We're now um, issuing contracts using those general fund dollars to provide services in the rural parts of the county for youth homeless services and for rapid rehousing. So we've, we've begun to, to initiate that plan. We've begun to execute the plan that we've been talking about, which is redirecting some of our non-restricted funds that have been typically spent in the metro region. We're now, we're now redirecting it to the rural areas. So that's now happening. So we have, have you yet to do outreach on that to the communities, and do we have any takers? Any yeah, sense? we have. Yes, we, and we do have some takers. So um, Ant Farm was one of the agencies that was awarded the contract in Sandy, and they will be providing youth, home, youth homeless services in Sandy, Estacada, and Malala, according to their program design. Um, we've also encouraged other rural providers to become qualified under the Tri-County Pool, and so I'm hopeful that many of them responded and they'll become qualified, so that when we issue procurements in the future, we can do so uh, based on all available dollars, 
we'll have a qualified pool that will be, we can say we need more shelter. And if a rural provider says, I'm here, we can direct non-restricted funds to that contract. And if a metro provider says, I'm here, we can use SHS funding for that, that program. Okay, Commissioner Schrader. Yeah, you've done a great job. I really appreciate all of this. Can you, can you give us just a list of some of the providers you're working with with all of this? Um, because there's multiple providers, and I'd just like to know who's on first with that. So Sure, yeah, I can okay. respond in writing yeah, with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Commissioner Savas? Yeah, um, really appreciate all the information and the data. Um, mm -hmm. That's valuable. It was a pretty lengthy report. I think I understand, you know, a lot of it, but I don't understand all of it. But I have a few questions. I'll start with the easy one first. The $8.5 million, how, how long is that contract? I mean, what does that mean over a period of time? Yeah, that's $8.5 million in a, a, annually. Annual? Okay. Yep. All right. Um, the, the, on the very last page with the spreadsheet, I, I struggled to understand this. And so let me just ask you one overall question that at least helped me get a better grip. Um, what is our, once this 8.5 is implemented, what will be our ongoing annual expenditure, roughly, of the supportive housing services dollars? How much are we spending of it versus how much of it is being still awaiting to be allocated? Yeah, we're, we're um, looking now to be committed across the contracts and with the, the rent assistance contracts that are administered by the Regional Long-Term Rent Assistance Program. Um, we're we're approaching a $40 million ongoing budget for, for supportive housing services in committed funds. Okay. So we're, we're almost, we almost use it all up. Uh, Adam Brown has joined me. Good morning, commissioner Adam Brown, deputy director of health, housing and human services. So, um, there's, board, there's, there's sort of short and long-term implications to your question. So when Vahid talks about $8 million in procurements, that's the annualized amount, as he just said. So when you look at all of the procurement activities that we're carrying out, um, we're looking at what's the annualized cost of the contracts that we're negotiating, right? And we're trying to peg that to this initial estimated annualized ongoing amount that will increase over time just as you know revenue increases increases over time it'll fluctuate year to year but there's there's this sweet spot right of the average annualized amount so metro has given us a five-year forecast now so we can kind of look to the future we know that in these these early years it's between 40 and 45 million and then towards the out years of that forecast it starts working up towards over 50 million towards 60 million and so that's kind of the the long range planning is um, negotiating contracts and, and building out the ongoing services kind of pegged towards that amount. But then we know that in the current year, the spending towards those commitments will be less. So then it's, there's an accumulated balance of one-time funds and how do, we, how do we spread that accumulated balance? How do we develop a spend down plan for that balance that kind of you know, spends it over a series of years on limited term investments? Okay. So yes, okay, I appreciate that. I understand the distinction between, you know, what maybe we haven't spent that is one time versus the ongoing. So just trying to match the ongoing expenditures with the ongoing revenue stream to make sure we're steady. So how much room do we have there to expand on an ongoing basis? Yeah, I mean, the, the goal of my team right now is to kind of get to the full commitment to really not have... Um, you know, uncommitted funded, uh, you know, unprogrammed funding. So that's all now kind of, and that will come in the, the, the budget that will be submitted in, in this month. Yeah, on, on March 20th. And Commissioner, that, that's exactly what we're working on right now, yep. is what are the annualized commitments that we've made based on the contracts we've negotiated? What are the other sort of placeholder commitments for yet to come procurements? And, and um, where are we at relative to that ongoing amount? That, that's literally what we, we've been working on together over the last couple of weeks, and then determining the accumulated one-time amount and what are some investments that we might be able to contemplate over the next few years on a limited-term basis with those dollars. Yeah, so, okay, I appreciate that. So as I hear the 8.5, yeah, I'm excited by that. We're getting more dollars out. People are coming on board. I know we're all having staffing issues internal and also with the, with the uh, CBOs, right? Yeah. So we, we realize that we need more capacity. Um, 
So if I take the 8.5 and I subtract it from, let's just say, 40 million as a rough number of SHS, we, we have deployed 32 million today or 30, 30 million dollars deployed? I mean, I, so this, so the 8.5 million was one of the procurements, right? Can you right. can you share with him what the other procurements are that we have already run preceding that, and what what are in the works now? Yeah. So so prior to these large procurements, we had the existing programs that you know themselves were you know we're seeing a three million dollar expense in one quarter from those programs. So that's you know a 12 million dollar annualized uh, baseline that we were building on top of. And so the 8.5 goes on top of that. The ARLA budget, the, the budget for our regional long-term rent assistance program is over $10 million in the coming fiscal year. So that's, that's a significant chunk of it. And that will always continue to be a larger chunk until we get to our goal of a, a little over 1,100 households or right around 1,100 households for, for long-term rent assistance. And then um, as Adam mentioned, we have a few placeholders where we've programmed in our budget th those dollars, but they're not yet contracted. An example of that is the turnkey programming. So that's, that's a, a placeholder that's programmed already in the coming budget. It's just we don't yet have a contract that's, that's procurement yet to, well, that's procurement out now. Right, right. Well, I want to be able at some point, no, not today, not here, yep. but I want to be at some point to understand um, knowing what the LIP states and, and then also the work plan is, you know, subordinate mm -hmm. to that, so to speak, uh, what the apportionment of the expenditures are to treat population A and population B and should we, should we or should we not be advocating for an adjustment um, in the LIP as far as the language of the programming that is, you know, maybe custom for Clackamas County versus maybe others. So I'm just wondering when we have the smarts or the wherewithal to say we need a tweak here or a tweak there. Um, and also want to get an idea of how effective, you know, we are and try to understand. I see the, the bare metrics, but long term, is there going to be recidivism, so to speak, in the terms of people falling out of, mm -hmm. uh, falling out of being housed? How many people are actually, you know, what's our long term success rate? I'm trying to get an idea of that and, and what the cost is per person. Uh, for this. So I, I don't want to divide these numbers into $40 million. That's a very scary number per person. Um, and I'll last, I'll just leave you with this last question, I think, and that is um, how, much of, how much of the SHS dollars is being annualized for internal expenditures to oversee all of this? That is, is that an HACC function or, or an H3S function? Yeah, so the, the measure allows for up for the county to retain up to 5% for administration. Um, and so that's that's amounting to, you know, your 5% fi of your $40 million is around $2 million is the annual amount that the county will have to support the administration. Um, and then there's, there's other, you know, direct program expenses that we have, right? Like not all of our staff are considered administrative staff. We have folks that are helping our providers deliver the programs and services, and that's considered a program expense. Okay. So the actual amount that we have available to us to deliver the services is, is much more than just what's restricted to pure admin. Are you fully staffed to do this program now? Close. We're really close. Mm -hmm. okay. we're, we're close. Okay. Uh, I'd like to go over, not today, I want to go over the spreadsheet because I, I had a hard time tracking, especially the last two or three rows. I don't get it. Um, um, it's, it was confusing to me, but, but at a later, here sometime soon, you know, whether you give me a digital file or a little bit of a briefing, I need to better understand the spreadsheet. I, I couldn't follow it. Can I join you with that? I'd like to. Sure. And, and I'm happy. This is this one is almost like a, a sit down and talk it through. Yeah. Um, I think that that would go a long ways. And I'll just I'll also say I'm really, really excited for you all to see how the fiscal year 2024 budget is constructed for the Housing and Community Development Division. We're going to have a level of visibility into the categories of program investments in homeless services that that you just haven't had before. So the new division has system support and coordination programming. It has outreach and engagement. It has safety off the streets, housing placement and retention, supportive housing, admin and operations. And, and we're gonna be able to very easily show you across those different program categories how the resources are invested, both the bulk of the SHS funds and all of the other funding that we have that supports these programs and services. It's just, a, it's, it's not even, it's apples to oranges in terms of the visibility that you've had before. Yeah. Yep.
Yeah, and of course, well, we're always asking for more, right? <laughs> well, we're getting more. Yeah. I mean, we're getting more. We've never been in this position before. That's right. And I do think a briefing is uh, warranted on that, Gary, when our staff gets ready for that. Mark? Mm -hmm. uh, Vahid, you mentioned that there's five new contracts for outreach. Uh, while you're doing outreach, what percentage of those people who are currently homeless are in need of mental health or addiction counseling, and do we have the capacity to provide that counseling? And finally, uh, once a contact's made and you have a homeless person who's resistant to taking a safety off the street accommodations, what process do you have to continue to work on them so that we can, in fact, move them off the street? That my question is based on uh, observation from Portland recently where they had a big effort, outreach effort, and the result of that effort, I think 1,700 homeless people involved, a very small amount agreed to counseling. And, and in my view, that counseling, mental health treatment, that new health that would be provided to those people is the real key to reducing homeless numbers. How are we doing on those things? Thank you, Commissioner. So, so a few questions in there. Um, the, with respect to the, the kind of the percentage of folks that are experiencing homelessness that we connect with that are, um, that are in need of counseling services, it, it's, that's a little bit difficult to get at with our administrative data from, from the homeless management information system. We can it, to, to an extent. So. Um, when, when folks are, are literally homeless, then we do ask additional questions about their medical vulnerability, which includes getting at addiction recovery, the need for counseling services, and those kind of show up as disabling conditions in that administrative data. So we can, we can provide you information about what percentage of folks who are unsheltered show up with disabling conditions in our administrative data. Getting, dr drilling down into what specific disabling conditions is a little bit murkier, but we can, we can attempt to do so based on that data. It's not the best to get at your question, but um, you know, our, our administrative data tells us about the housing needs of po folks in the community specifically, and not so much about their health needs. But we, we, can, res we can be somewhat responsive there. Um, we, um, so that was one question. With respect to <clears throat> the, the, I know that I, I'm familiar with that news story you're, you're referring to. Um, you know, I'm very proud of our outreach programming and the, the coordination of our system. Um, this is not, fly by night, you know, go and go and make one attempt at talking to this person, offer them the moon, and then if they say no, you know, we wash our hands with them. That's not how we operate our programming in Clackamas County. So our outreach professionals include people that are, are certified alcohol and drug counselors. So our largest outreach program is with Central City Concern. It's the lead law enforcement assisted diversion program. Um, one of these contracts is a significant expansion of that program with a lot more folks out in the community. Those are certified alcohol and drug counselors themselves, those folks that are doing that outreach. So they're, they're able to engage with folks immediately on connecting them with that system if that's what they, if they're ready for that right now. And we also have a contract with Providence. So that's also uh, health professionals who are doing outreach in the community connected to people experiencing homelessness who are frequently showing up in the emergency room. And our outreach community is closely coordinated by people on my staff. Um, it, they're doing what it takes to develop the relationship, to build trust with people in the community, and connect them with the services that they need. It might start with a no thank you, I'm not interested, but we don't stop there. And so our, and we don't allow our partners to stop there. So you, you need to go the extra mile. Um, I was in a call this weekend with some of my partners at Love One and at LEAD, and they described going out to uh, an individual in the Newell Creek Canyon 22 times. He's now at Tukwila. He's housed in one of our permanent supportive housing programs. But it took a lot of visits to develop that trust and relationship. And he, he built a cabin in the woods. He was <clears throat> said, I'm not, if, if you come to ask me to leave, bring the helicopters, because I've got an arsenal. That's how, that was how it started. And now he's, he's housed in our community, you know, and, and he's doing well. OK, well, thank you, Vahe. Yeah, thanks. Um, so getting the money out the door, so to speak, um, could pose a challenge because we're having more money coming in. Are we reaching out to the cities, each city in Clackamas County, and asking them, um, do they have a need for this? 
would you like to partner? And that may be a reversal of what we've done in the past, but uh, how are we doing on that? We are talking to the cities about opportunities for partnership, Chair. Yes. But doesn't necessarily have to be homeless housing. And uh, now let's talk about the word affordable housing for a minute. Like Oswego is doing this and this, and they have a couple projects over there. And their mayor cites the high cost of land in Lake Oswego. We all know that. So are there areas that where we have money that could aid cities in what um, on the projects that they want to do? And I think this is a really good conversation to to tee up for the spend down plan. Right. Yep. We we have one time funds. We could make strategic capital investments and in built infrastructure. That was one of the reasons we were advocating so hard for the quality in, right? Because we were confident that that was exactly the kind of infrastructure that we needed to leverage the ongoing SHS funds. But those were one time turnkey dollars, affordable housing bond dollars. Well, now we, we have an accumulated balance of one time SHS dollars that can be used for things like strategic capital investment. So that's the conversation. We, we're, we are planning to build the 24 budget with some placeholders in there like saying, okay, we, we think we want to set aside some money to have this conversation with you and then bring that conversation up over the next few months about, all right, what do we want to do about that? So regarding the spend down plan, I would like you to be able to target some cities <clears throat> out there that could initially say, yes, we're interested, but they don't have to commit and we don't have to commit. So when you come back to us about the spend down programs, well, the city of uh, Lake Oswego is interested in XYZ. We don't know what that might be, or they may not be interested in that. And are any of these funds restricted? They're, they're restricted to the programs and services of, of the SHS measure and, of course, the geographical boundary. But otherwise, we do, we do have a lot of flexibility within so, that. So, like you say, we have state funds that we're diverting away because we have the backfill. Mm -hmm. So I, I assume on the spend down would include the rural areas of funds that we're diverting out of the main pot and putting out into the rural areas. No? Well, that, that's part of our sort of core strategy, it's not, not so much for the spend down of, of accumulated one-time funds, but to, to make ongoing commitments to the rural areas. So that's, that's a process we're, we're doing right now. But, but Chair, the, the accumulation of the one-time balance is specific to the SHS funds. Yes, I understand. Yes, right. And that is a boundary. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Savas? Yeah, I, I always, I'm always concerned about the, you know, the longevity um, or the steadiness of the funding streams and then when, you know, there's an opportunity for, um, you know, a surge or let's say a surplus in this case, right? That sometimes it's not does not result in you know setting up a uh, a high bar in which we know it's temporary funding and it it, it ramps down and then you know we have been uh, victims of so to speak this commission has been accused of cutting funding where we didn't really cut funding one time fundings one time funding if someone doesn't win an award but the monies are still being spent with someone who did win the award you know we've been it's been politicized and say that we, we cut funding when we really didn't cut funding that person just didn't or that CBO maybe didn't win the award. So I'm also worried, you know, in kind, uh, so to speak, that if we provide some funding for the cities that it's well established that it's one time funding because we have this surplus and there's an ability to ramp either. Well, obviously ramp those dollars down, but at the same time, they need to ramp their funding. If they want to maintain whatever service they're providing. So I just worry about the future, um, not really looking that far out ahead. Even what if the voters in seven or eight years here don't say yes to renewing 26210? Uh, we're in some, we're going to be in, in a hard, difficult position. Uh, that that worries me tremendously. So I think we need to generate, show success um, in this, and um, having the numbers here so we can plan on the trends and see what, to see how many people we're treating. I'm waiting for the point in time count, July, June. Yeah, we should. We will be able to have that out by the summer for sure. Okay. Yeah, I'm really, really want to see if we're making advances and bringing down that number of in the point in time count. I hope. If not, we're. It's looking pretty. Yeah, it's kind of concerning. I'll leave it there. But I appreciate all the little work you're doing and all the data, and hopefully you can get a little bit more to get some little bit more clarity around around our successes and the populations we're treating. So, thanks. 
Thank you, and it was a very good report um, on this. I almost think there should be more front and center on our web page to let the people know what we're doing. The assumption is that we're not doing anything. Why aren't you doing something about addiction? Why aren't you doing something about mental health? Well, we are, and I think that we're not doing a very good job of tooting our own horn. And I think that's a marketing strategy we need to engage in. And Vahid, you and I have had a conversation about that. We really do need to talk about our successes. The amount of money that's coming in, because that's transparency, the mm -hmm. amount of money is taxpayer money. Even though Metro, you know, did it, it's taxpayer money that taxpayers need to know how and when their dollars are being spent. Right, Gary? Yes. Okay. Um, seeing no other questions, thank you very much for your report. Thank you. Next, Advisory Board and Commission appointments. Tony, go ahead. Mental Health and Addictions Council, staffed by Behavioral Health Division, Health Housing Human Services, currently has 10 openings on their commission. Jeez. Through a recruitment process, four applications were received, three are recommended for appointment, one withdrew their application. Recommendations are Sarah Clement to a first term, Sherry Price to a second term, Kathy Horry to a first term. I'll entertain a motion. I move approval of those individuals. Second. Commissioner Schrader has moved approval of Sarah Clement, Sherry Price, Kathy Horry to the Mental Health and Addictions Council. Commissioner Savas to second the motion. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Tony, please take the poll. Commissioner Scholl. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Savas. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye. Motion passes 4 0. Thank you. Next, your business meeting and review for this Thursday, March 9th, 2023. It is an evening meeting at 6 p.m. You have all the consent agenda items from today that you approved to put forward, and you will have a public hearing, which is an annexation boundary change proposal for Clackamas County Service District Number 1, which is Water Environment Services. If you have any questions on any item on the business meeting, please let me know, and staff is happy to answer it for you prior to Thursday. Uh, we've plowed through the list, Chair. The final item is Commissioner Communications. Yay, and we have time for that today that we didn't before. I think I'll start at this end. Commissioner Savas? Could you start on the other end? I was still yes. processing what I was going to yes. say. Commissioner Schultz, please okay. go ahead. <laughs> no problem. On uh, 15 February, Caroline Hill and I uh, visited the Canby Center. Uh, it's a faith-based nonprofit that helps youth and families in the Canby, Hubbard, and Aurora area. They have a very dynamic project underway. Uh, the construction of a new building on their current site. Uh, the cost will be $6.15 million, and through hard work, they have accumulated $5.3 million, and so they have a shortfall of about $850,000. Uh, Ray Keene, the director down there, and the staff do, a, I think, a tremendous job for the community of Canby in helping people, and their focus is meeting people at their point of need and giving them the support they need to stay housed, stay healthy. Um, I, I can't tell you how impressed I am with the, the Canby Center. Uh, last week I uh, asked Carolyn Hill to send out a memo I did uh, describing what they do for the community and with the uh, uh, idea to ask you to consider, th think over, what we can do to help them in their effort to get a little bit closer to uh, fulfilling their budget requirements for this new building. And if you would just look at that this week, uh, next week uh, at the issues meeting, I would like to uh, maybe make a motion on this. Thank so you. what are you asking for, Commissioner Shaw? And how you say they've raised 6.15? No, they, they, their project cost is six. Point five million. They have raised five point three million, so they have right around about eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars shortfall. And uh, I think when we look at what the Cami Center does for the, that community down there, it's tremendous. And if we could do something, maybe some ARPA dollars to help them get a little bit closer, maybe not certainly not eight hundred fifty thousand. That's 
probably way too much, but whatever we can do to help them move closer to, to construction. I'm telling you, if they can get, what they do in their current building is tremendous, but mm -hmm. this new building with outreach, training, uh, food support, uh, they'll be able to really assist Canby even, even better. Um, it occurs to me, uh, this is a faith-based organization and they're doing social work. It occurs to me, Gary, help me with this, trying to identify funds for this. Like you say, we may not be able to do the 800, no. but yeah. we can help them. What about H3S and through some of their programs? Um, has has um, that department, unfortunately, Rod Cook, you're sitting in here, you're being put on the spot. Is there an avenue through that department that we could help? Yes, I think community development block grants, because you did that with the Clackamas Volunteers in Medicine for That's construction. Right. This is a construction request. It's possible. Uh, I don't expect Rod to know the answer. We'd have to check with his staff to confirm that is a good funding source and to see if the Canby Center has actually reached out to our staff. I don't know if that's true. We can find that out. Um, if I may chair, so I noticed, Commissioner Shell, you mentioned a lottery dollars. Unfortunately, this is not an eligible use of lottery dollars for construction, so that would not be eligible. You could, use, you could use ARPA dollars, that is a possibility. Uh, you could direct me to use general fund, although I don't, re I don't recommend that, but it's possible to use ARPA. I'd like to pursue further with H3S to see if there are funding streams there that could be eligible. And the reason why we haven't pursued ARPA dollars on anything yet is because, don't shoot the messenger, mm -hmm. is we're still waiting for yet a new opinion coming down from the US Treasury on what we can use that for. And it sounds like they're going to open it up to anything, but we need to wait for that decision to happen before we can spend it on anything because we don't want to be held on the old one. So, Mark, uh, maybe you can get together with Gary and Rod and have this organization reach out mm -hmm. because in the past, um, organizations that knew about um, community block ads were successful when they initiated the action. But that's, but that's a good issue yeah. spotting. Good. Well, thank you very much for your consideration of this. I appreciate it. Um, Martha, you have your light on. Do you want to go next? Yeah, I just wanted to thank Commissioner Schell because I was there earlier. I think you came later. And I was there at the place, and it was pretty remarkable. Uh, they're kind of a one-stop shop. You know, I lived in Canby for 36 years, and um, this was a long time coming. And I think that any kind of expansion that they can do would well serve that community. And the other thing that they said to me was they're looking to also expand maybe to the other communities, not just Canby, because their model mm. seems to be working really well. So I would really encourage, I like the idea of, of uh, uh, having H3S just make sure that these folks are on their radar stream as part of the portfolio of uh, organizations that we work with for human service delivery systems. I really like the idea of a CDBG grant. Um, uh, I wouldn't, I'm not adverse to ARPA dollars either, but we're gonna have a long list for that. But um, I think there's a way to help them and it, that's an area, like I said, it has been a long time coming. It's nice finally to see those needs being met, uh, particularly um, with the Hispanic community there in a really yeah. big way, yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Schrader. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's great. Well, Commissioner Schrader, you have the floor. You want to continue? Yeah. So um, I'm going to start by saying please don't kill the messenger, okay? But I did uh, talk to Ben Prey the other day from Home Forward. And um, it's the same issue kind of we had to deal with with um, another project with Tom Renicky. They are having two rural developments, okay? Malala 1, Malala 2. Estacada 1, Estacada 2. All right, and I t well, talked with him the other day, so I'm going to read from my notes so I'm sure that I'm correct with what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, Malala 1 was granted abatement in the form of an annual pilot fee of $25,000. Um, I think that was from us. I'm not sure. I think it was. Yes. Yeah. Um, Okay, and Home First is seeking the same support uh, pilot programs of approximately $415 per unit per year for the second phase, which is going to be 40 units, and both phases of the Estacada development. So that's going on in Estacada. None of the remaining, remaining development use metro funds are tax credits. They are funded with bank debt and OHCS funding. Okay, that's Oregon Health, you know, Housing Health 
folks from the state. So their, their issue is, as the interest rates continue to rise, they're looking to reduce ongoing expenses, and the taxes are the big tick, ticket item. Both developments in Malala and Estacada have support from their mayors and their city councils. Um, both developments have community rooms, large units for families. The Estacada sites are in a wildfire area. They, they did that. And they're asking, uh, again, a reduction in taxes to, uh, to increase, uh, you know, to keep the debt load down so they can move these projects um, on. Now, there's a timeline. Malala One is under construction, and that's going to be complete this fall. It's on schedule, and Home First hopes to have commissioners on hand. They want to invite us to that. Estacada, 36 units, is under construction. Uh, the same pilot terms as Malala One, and that'll be complete in December. Estacada Two has 48 units. They're applying for lift funds later this month, and Home First to tell OHCS that pilot reflects the county support of rural development for families. Okay, Malala Two has 40 units. It breaks ground this summer and assume the same pilot terms as Malala. I can send these notes to you, mm -hmm. okay? So you just have them in front of you. But we're facing a similar situation where they are asking for a tax abatement. And I did tell Mr. Prey I would bring it up under issues. I don't know if we can make a decision now or not. I'm not necessarily asking that. I, I do feel that tax abatements um, in the long term actually do save us money, although I haven't done a cost-benefit analysis of that, because once we're getting people housed and stabilized and in these units, they're less likely to really um, have an issue with you know, some of our other services that we have to deliver with mental health and things of that nature. So uh, even though you know, we're spending money or we, we're forgiving taxes up front, I think long term there's an assertion to be made that in, in the long run, housing people is going to save us dollars. Now, I do know that this is going to be a difficult decision. Uh, I'm putting it out there because Mr. Prey talked to me directly. Um, the one tax abatement we didn't give was in the urban area, and they had gotten more revenue streams from uh, the metro folks. These are in rural communities that is kind of really, um, really beginning to move ahead with housing. And so I just wanted to put that on the table. Uh, Gary, I don't know when we should discuss this or have a decision. I'm just bringing it up um, today. And I don't know if this board wants to have a further discussion on this or not. Well, Commissioner Savas is in the queue and I have some questions that haven't sure. been answered. Um, Paul, do you want to go ahead then I'll follow up? Yeah, well, yeah, mine's mine's more, so I just want to just give some historical context so everyone's got to understand, you know, this. And, you know, it, it's painful for me because I felt as though I wasn't listened to years back when I made this during this period of time. But back when we made the tax relief for Rosewood, whatever, Rosewood, whatever it was called, Rosewood Station, the unit off of Fuller Road. But um, I, you know, shortly after that, I, I had concerns then, but what, during that period of time, I was making the argument and, um, and a concern and finance staff did not recognize it at the time that we were actually underwater in our forecast and that we were actually spending more money than we actually realized uh, and had less money than when we actually realized. So actually we were underwater. Um, and so during that time, unbeknownst to the rest of everyone else, because it was only myself and I was being, you know, at times during the budget criticized for those statements. Um, but again, the math kind of led me to believe that there's no way we could be where we were, which was flush with cash. We weren't flush with cash. So we approved the property tax relief at that particular mm -hmm. facility. And um, shortly after, um, our dear past friend, um, Anna Geller, you know, had approached mm -hmm. myself and, and Commissioner Bernard and saying that was not a wise choice and explained why and there were other ways of doing the funding for these things and she had tremendous experience. So we, we heard that. So both Commissioner Bernard and I, you know, listened, heard that. And then we had, moving the clock forward, we had the Malala ask here about a year and a half ago prior to the courthouse decision. Yeah for that relief, felt like a small little thing. We did that for the reasons you cited, Commissioner. Um, but shortly after that, 
um, you know, number one, a greater realization that the math with the budget and the forecasting was indeed years back incorrect, um, and getting a more sharpened focus, and I trust our finance staff that the numbers are more realistic today, but we have not, this is what pains me, we have not demonstrated a clear, certain path to fund the courthouse. The funding decision for the courthouse came after the property tax relief in Malala. Um, you know, I did not anticipate that the costs would go up and the payments would be where they are, but we got to make 15, first year, $15 million payment, and then it just continues to grow um, for that 30 years. And long-term commitments are such as this, like property tax relief, are more problematic for me than one-time funding. If there's a small thing we can do, great if we can do that. But this ongoing stuff concerns me because the only way that the dollars we're going to use to pay for the courthouse, once we figure out where they're going to come from, they are property tax dollars. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, can I just make one correction? Not, not with what you said. Um, actually, it's home first, not home forward. I just got a text from Christina. Uh, so I don't want to misspeak with that. And yes, I do understand the dilemma we face with this. And um, I know that you've been um, uh, really uh, on top of the budget issues, Commissioner, which I've always been grateful for. Um, I don't know where we're going to go with this. I, will, I, I, I still think if I could get a cost-benefit analysis, I, I don't know if we can do that to see if indeed, as I suspect, I don't have the numbers, then in the end it saves us money by giving a property tax abatement because we're not, we're actually reducing the level of services that we have people once we get them housed and we finally get them stabilized. But, so that's all okay, I have to say I about that. I have some so. questions here. Yeah. Um, you said $450 per unit per year on 80 units, that's $33,200 mm -hmm. over how many years, 30 years? That tends to add up over time. And there's and your ask is lacking in the total amount of money this is going to cost our general fund over, that's what a tax abatement is. Okay, why don't okay. I, I'll and find that out. Okay. You Sorry. said the cities offered support. They supported this. Yes. D did they bring in their money? I don't know the answer to that. So you say support. Did they use their own tax base in these cities to pay for it? Or do they support somebody going to Clackamas County and asking the county to pay for the city projects? I'm not clear on that. Also, is there any way we can use some of our affordable housing dollars that are outside mm -hmm. Uh, the metro boundary to do this. I don't know at what stage of development or building they're at, but I'm in, I'm in Paul's um, shoes here. I don't support this. We turned down one, what, several weeks ago, the exact same ask. We're just not in the position to do this. I understand interest rates are going up. It's hurting all of us everywhere on every single construction project we have in this county of county-sponsored construction projects. I think it's really easy to come to the county with their thinking is, oh, we can just take our tax dollars away when our property tax dollars are probably going to flatten out mm -hmm. because we're not going to see the growth because of inflation. We're not going to see the growth because we could have a downturn in the economy. I hope that doesn't happen. But there's just that situation out there that this is not feasible. Um, at this time, or probably into the near future, Commissioner Schrader. Yeah, thank you, um, Chair. I'll get those answers from you just so we have it on the record. I just I texted Christina your specific answers to that. And um, like I said, don't kill the messenger. Uh, I get approached by people, and I tell them that I'm going to speak to you about it. And again, I'm OK with it, but if, if it's the will of the board, so now, when you look at the Canby Center, if we can identify, like Paul said, a one-time funding, mm, it's out the door, we're done. Our hands, well, you know, we're not stuck, you know, paying for somebody else's project for over, over years. And frankly, these builders out there, I understand they could get caught in this quagmire of what they thought the project was going to cost and the actual cost coming in. And I do feel for them. I'm thankful that we don't have any more building projects going on than we do right now. 
okay. But there is a huge need out there. The state legislature has been inundated with asks they, that funded two years ago, and now those costs have gone up. So we're all feeling it. I, I just don't see how uh, we can do this at the county level. Commissioner Savas? Yeah, I just, uh, I, you know, just want to just mention a couple things. Number one, um, you know, I'm not adverse to finding other ways of defraying some of the upfront cost uh, or construction cost or permitting cost or whatever else we can do for these projects here and there because they, again, they are one time, right? And if we can, we can defray their, their startup cost um, that potentially is going to be borrowed upon, we're, we're improving their long-term, you know, their position on the long-term thing. So their bottom line would improve if there's some other means of doing this. So it's, it's not, I want to make it perfectly clear, I'm not uh, right. adverse to helping them in a more practical way that is sustainable. Um, I, 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 I forgot to mention during the other issue when Chair, you were speaking about the cities, and we had Vahid up here and Adam up here about the city's role. And I, translating that into the conversation we're having here, what can the cities do to help in that same vein, right? If they can proffer something, mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of things the cities can do. Uh, we've talked about this at C4 extensively, actually, because the C4 membership has kind of expanded our interest level in things besides transportation and simply land use into this housing situation. So I'm hearing requests by the cities, and I, the same token, I have saying, okay, well, what can you do to step up? Can you offer a piece of property? Um, you know, maybe there's a property that is in your area or there's zoning that can be done yeah. that can, you know, you can, you can provide that at no cost to defray the land use cost of it and permitting and so forth. So there are things the cities can do. We can help partner with them, but it shouldn't just be the cities just asking mm -hmm. for help. I think they need to, as I think the chair was trying to say, show me, I won't say necessarily show me the money, but show us how you can help with this financial dilemma, right? Bring some, bring something material that, that assists. It doesn't have to be cash per se. It can be something else other than cash. So, so can I make a suggestion, Chair? Am I out of line? If no, I go okay. ahead. Talk. So why don't we, uh, Commissioner, why don't we work with, um, I see Rod in the back. This is a tool I know that uh, people have used extensively in the past. If it's not a tool that we are able to use now, can we work together with Rod and talk to the mayors and some of those folks and attempt to problem solve to figure out how we can help? Yeah, I would like to know what kind of support coming in from the cities besides asking the county for money. I think I, I they know, need I some know. skin in the game too. Yeah, part of the issue, um, if I just could say something about that too. Part of the issue we deal with is uh, we have smaller cities, so they don't have, well, the reason they come to us is that they don't have the bandwidth we do in terms of the social service delivery systems that's kind of been, and housing is part of that. So that's why it kind of falls in our lap a lot of the time. So I don't blame them for coming to us, but yes, let's see if we can work something out that's so different. Yeah. When you said that, it made me think of something else. Did this builder go ahead and construct these projects that were probably market rate apartments? See, I don't know if they're market rate apartments or I, I don't know if they're assisted or just a minute, let me finish, or affordable housing. Then all of a sudden he's in this situation, oh, I'm going to convert over all of a sudden I'm going to convert to uh, affordable housing because that's where that pot of money is. So I'm unclear on that as well. I would like to know the location of these apartments in Malala and who the builder is. The main guy, I suspect I know who he is, and <clears throat> that's important. So um, there, there's a lot of unknowns about this, but Commissioner Schrader, this is the second time you brought a tax abatement um, situation before Clackamas County, and this is the second time we've said no. I, so I, I would I'm encourage you in your conversations, no. let me finish, I would encourage you in the conversations to think outside of the resources that we actually have in the county of all that we've mentioned here today and use that route, if you could. Yes, and I'm, I, with all due respect, I'm not trying to put anybody on the spot. That's not my intention. People approach me, they want me to say something. I say yes. Like I said, don't kill the messenger. Uh, I'm one, one person, I'm okay. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Why don't you 
started laughing. That's, but I just felt that I needed to bring it forward because I committed to this individual. And um, Christine is listening. I'll make sure we get the answer to those questions. And maybe I can work with Rod and some of our other folks to look at what's out there. And maybe Commissioner Savage, you can help me. And maybe, Commissioner, you want to help too. I know you have a heart for this. So. Well, I do have a heart, but I'm also, I feel like I got to watch the, the I know, budget. I understand it. You know, I, know. Well, I mean, you know, we could just like, you know, spend down every single one of our reserves, contingencies, and general fund. Mm, we're out of money. We can shut the doors, roll up the carpets, and go home. We could do that. We could take that approach. So, you know, I tend to get, I tend to get very protective of the budget because I don't want us to be in a situation where we can't, frankly, afford to pay our bills. Mm -hmm. Every single commissioner really needs to understand and identify pockets of money when we go out into the community. Just because the builder asks us for tax abatement, that may not be the only remedy for him. It would be encompassed upon us as leaders. You say we have this great bandwidth to say, hmm, maybe there's a different way to help you on your construction costs. It's, you know, I'm really glad we sold the bonds on the courthouse last summer. Yeah. Because those are fixed payments. Those interest rates are fixed. Because I just read this morning, Powell before the Senate committee today said, hmm, interest rates are going up, probably a minimum, we're going up to 5.5%. And they're going to keep doing that because the economy is still rolling. So I feel for this builder. I do. But let's try to do something while we protect our general fund. I guess those are my comments for today. <laughs> Thank you for indulging me, Chair. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Chair? Yeah. I haven't had my, cha my, oh, my I issues you up. I did. I'm sorry. No, I not yet. I, I deferred. Um, so, yeah, I just want to just follow up on that conversation, Chair, and say that um, what pains me a little bit, just mathematically, is that, um, and I, I say this in response to an op-ed I read by one of our former Budget Committee members that was just printed here recently. Um, the being respectful to all here, um, but had we actually really hunkered down and realized and, and created the glide path, which I use those terms often when I was making my plea for more const restraint on spending. Um, you know, when I bought my home, for example, um, I say, we say for years, we put money away to buy our home because we knew we needed to make the down payment, right? And we knew that if that the larger the down payment, the, the lower the, the costs or the payments would have been over the 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. so, on, so I just look at had we done that, had we started the glide path years back, um, the one-time money, because we spent to the limit, if we would have put away all that money, that $13 million that of the, you know, in the red of that one year, and all the backfill down, we would have tens of millions of dollars to upfront the courthouse cost to lower the payment. Mm -hmm. But we didn't, and we don't. We don't have it today. And it's that foresight, that mathematical planning and thinking about how to position ourselves to do that. And I think, you know, we've got we've got a conundrum here. We have not yet solved. Mm -hmm. um, so anyhow, back to my comments for today, Chair. Um, uh, tomorrow we'll have uh, ODOT here to talk about the EA um, mm -hmm. and everything else. That's a big issue. Um, Burn up my phone on all ends, uh, all hours it seems. Uh, there's a lot of, I think there's people that are thinking we're not doing anything. So I want to just, speaking to the public out there, my colleagues know this, we are, we have tasked our staff and our staff are responding and they're doing a lot of research and going through over 2,000 pages of this environmental analysis with ODOT on this tolling. And, and while that, in the background, the state and the legislature got all these bills, I'm concerned that, you know, the, what if the governor just vetoes a bill, so on and so forth. It's, there's no, I have no security that, um, uh, that a bill is going to be the, you know, what we should hang our hat on and, and be assured that it's going to resolve the tolling challenges we have. Um, so we'll have more on that as, as time goes. Um, the other issue, and I <clears throat> had my monthly meeting uh, follow up with uh, Dan Johnson, the head of our transportation development. And I, I shared this with some of you all um, here recently about some of the parking issues I see on the horizon and the challenges and which are growing and they're growing significantly. 
Um, I pointed this out when we talked about HP 2001 last year. Uh, we were talking about that, that we ought to be talking about a parking management plan. Um, I say this with, as I reflect upon some experiences here in the county and an increase of volume of complaints I'm hearing um, around the county, urban, rural, whichever, about parking challenges going on, whether it's people storing stuff on, on the street in front of their home or people that are parking their business trucks or camping or whatever it may be. There's a number of parking challenges and there's strategies out there that have been employed by, um, you know, whether here in Oregon or whether external, there's strategies that they got in front of this and, and, and there's areas where people have not and there's consequences. So I think we ought to bring forth a, uh, an agreement that we ought to bring forth some kind of a parking management plan going forward um, to cope with some of the challenges before us, especially if the governor has these superseding powers to bring in or, and, and not require parking for a lot of housing developments. Um, I saw firsthand in California in a couple areas where it was impossible, impossible to park anywhere, and it was right when the rains came, which made it worse. Um, walking a mile and a half was the nearest parking place I could find to actually go somewhere because it was in the evening and people were home, and when people are home, all those they need to park their car. And there was miles of parking along these high density developments because there was no parking right. provided by the high density developments, as an example. Lastly, um, the uh, I was reminded I was talking to one of our fellow elected uh, members in the in the region uh, last week, and I was reminded of the scenario with the CARES Act funding and reminding that elected official that Multnomah County. Washington County and the city of Portland got direct CARES Act funding from the federal government. Our portion on that same formula would have been about $75, $77 million. And we didn't get direct funding. Right. We got shorted. And I haven't forgotten that. That's not allowed us the ability to ramp up a number of things, supportive housing services, for example, in a few areas. We haven't been ever really reimbursed. Uh, we never got the remainder. We got reimbursement of, what, $19 million, I recall. But there's still 50 some odd million dollars sitting out there that we've never really recovered to get our fair share. The state took it all. And as I mentioned here a couple of weeks ago, or if not last week, are we keeping track of the unfunded mandates? Because frankly, I would really want to, I want to keep a ledger, frankly, of, of the CARES Act money we didn't get, the unfunded mandates that continue to pile on, and yet, you know, Commissioner Schrader, you're a perfectly legitimate ask for to build something for housing. I mean, those are, that's legitimate, but we don't have the means. And, and I'm just really concerned about the finances going forward. So I, I just hope maybe that, that, that Gary, I'm, you know, actually, I'm not here to put you on the spot, but do, do you need a formal action for us to initiate, um, you know, keeping track of the unfunded mandates over the last five years and how that's impacted our budgeting? Because I, I think I, when I talk to our legislators, I want to convey what that burden is and uh, in light of all the things that we're facing. Gary, I think there's some staff work being done on that. Mm -hmm. Staff is working with the Association of Oregon, Oregon counties, counties, who I sure hope has been tracking that on behalf of all counties of Oregon. If you want our county staff to do this, I do need you to vote on that board. That's a huge undertaking that will take a pri that will have to stop us some other work that our staff is doing. Well, yeah, um, let's see, and I agree with Commissioner Savas. You know, we could use specific examples, for instance. When the DA came forward and wanted a software update because the Oregon Judicial Department says, mm, you need to have a software update on the body cams so you can prosecute faster. That costs $7.5 million. That's an unfunded mandate, okay? Because evidently we're not prosecuting criminals fast enough when we're probably the one county in the tri-county area who is prosecuting criminals. But yet, we're not doing it fast enough, yet Multnomah County isn't even doing it at all. Oh, but they can escape, excuse me. So there are specific examples probably in the last year we can use. And then there's a multiplier attached to that. I agree with you fully on the ask on that, but if we could, like, anecdotally remember uh, situations like that. It, it I, yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't want to put a big, huge staff burden on there. It seems to me that those top-of-mind um, 
uh, recollections by individual departments should be pretty easy, at least in at least a year's worth, right? Maybe we can work backwards afterwards, but I don't think we can afford not to, frankly, because we can't snow. This snowball's growing. Mm -hmm. If the, if we allow this to continue, and they're not cognizant that we need to balance our budget, and they they shouldn't do it on our backs, right? Yep. Um, if we don't tell them now and let them know the magnitude of these expenses, we're we're, we're punishing ourselves. By remaining silent. Why don't we send a letter to the, each legislative member saying the unfunded mandates in Clackamas County, just something general to, to stop it because we all share the same constituents. Well, and, and I just want to say that the Association of Ar Oregon County should have that data. They track it pretty regularly, and I'll be glad to so. do that. I'll, I'll get a hold Would of you? that. And then the National Association of Counties also tracks this, and there's a database they have um, that I think will give us some information about not only the unfunded mandates here, but even federally that's coming down. Because they do, that's one of their big, since you, one of their big things. Since you do AOC and, and, a, and, a, and NACO, you, yeah, I'll you, go ahead and get right. that. I'll, I'll go ahead and get that information. Yeah, it may not be as heightened for other counties right now, because they don't have a $15 million courthouse payment to make. Well, that's, that's true, too, but. Are you finished? Yeah. OK, but you did remind me. Uh, to say what uh, I did yesterday was, oh my gosh, a huge day. We had the Supported Housing Services Oversight Committee made up of members from the uh, um, public. And ironically, the tri-chairs are not part of the committee and we are um, not panelists. We just sit there and listen until we hear something so egregious that they wanna do, then we opine on it. And that's probably what happened yesterday. Um, I, I tried to get this particular committee to understand the big elephant in the room, to at least acknowledge the big elephant in the room on the homeless crisis, and that is the governor when she declared a homeless emergency. And they were oblivious, and I was totally ignored on that. So, Monday night, I went to my tri-chairs meeting. And I said, look, when it comes to the SHS Oversight Committee and the Tri-County Planning Body Committee, of which I am both on, that is tomorrow, why don't we ask the governor to send a representative to sit and listen on all the housing opportunities we're doing, all the homeless programs we're doing. Because what the governor is doing is she is, from this spot over here, implementing her two uh, employees, Andrea Bell and Matt Garrett, who are wonderful people, by the way, but they don't know what we're doing, and what they're doing is they're putting initiatives down at the top for us to do, and it's stressing our staff. And like Adam Brown said last week, answering the governor's request is now a full-time job. And I tried to explain that during this oversight committee, and I tried to explain this to the Tri-County body uh, planning committee tonight or tomorrow, but more importantly, I explained it to the tri-chairs last night, and frankly, I did not get support from my tri-chairs. The first time ever, I did not have universal support for an ask that I considered to be so pragmatic and practical that we allow a representative from the governor's office to pay attention to the good things we're doing. Multnomah County says, eh, whatever. You know, we're doing it, we're doing it, but that's all that Multnomah County does. Multnomah County a government is social services. They don't have the 20 or 30 programs and departments that Clackamas County has or the 20 departments that Washington has. So I didn't get much support from them when in the past I have supported those two counties in their efforts. Well, it really didn't mean much to us, but I considered it a part of relationship building and supporting each other when there was a problem. And I was very, very disappointed in that, but I'm going to try to keep going on that. Uh, Monday morning at 8 a.m., I testified in the Senate Committee on Housing and Development on an RV bill that allows one RV on unincorporated Clackamas County lands it was dropped by Senator uh, Cedric Hayden, and it's looking like it's going to have good support coming out of the Senate. And my goal in this, again, Paul, is to make sure there are not mandates on what this bill does. Parts of it are permissive, parts of it are not. 
but the counties, I hope, will embrace this. There's been letters of support sent in that were unsolicited, totally unsolicited. And my main testimony was, you know, this is a government action that is actually leading to homelessness. When a lady had uh, her sister come and park an RV on her property because the sister's husband had died, they had lost the family home, she had two kids in school, so she was living there trying to get her feet back on the ground. Somebody called to complain because our complaints, because our zoning ordinances are complaint driven. I says, okay, I'll go to the county sta staff and see how we can fix this. Maybe it's a county ordinance that we cannot park an RV on people's property. One RV, that's all, one RV. Staff says, hmm. That's the state land use law. I says, you have got to be kidding me. So that's when I started the effort in the legislature to do this. By the way, the entire committee was very favorable of this. They just couldn't believe it, could not believe it. And they say, in your communities, you have abandoned RVs. You have RVs on the streets. Why? Because there is no other place to put them. The program is permissive, citing health, safety, and wellness. Just want to let you know uh, we're going forward on that, and thank you, commissioners, for your support. Chair, sure, just quick clarification: RVs to, to be for housing for people to live in, or just RVs on the property? I'm not Are on a place where there's already a home. They can a, park a, an a RV dwelling. to live in their RVs. Okay. That's, that's okay. I just want to make that clarification. Only one, only one RV. You know, we're not going to line them all up. And I cited, for instance, a relative situation or um, a friend situation, because you just probably, I mean, I wouldn't be taking anybody in off the street, but I think we all can look at some friends and relatives and see mm, there's a temporary housing need. Just let them come in, you know, get settled, figure out what they're trying to do with their life, get a job. If they have kids, get the kids in school to get back to some normalcy. So that's how that's gonna fall out. And I can give you folks a copy of the bill if you'd like. Um, seeing no further business before this commission, we're adjourned.